and welcome everybody to the first uh, Trading Club meeting of 2016. It's James, Halliwell and myself uh, from the Academy and we are going to do our monthly meeting. I have just come back from holiday this morning and uh, James has been preparing over the last week while I was lying on the beach and so he will be uh, the main man in this meeting and obviously I will give my uh, comments and, and views as he goes uh, through the presentation. So James maybe you want to kick off um, with what happened in 2015 and then after that we can look at what we expect for 2016. Sure, thank you Lex and welcome back everybody. Um, so in terms of 2015, the year that was, we'll, uh, we'll rattle through the, uh, the key points here as you can see. So it was very much uh, dominated by macroeconomics and ultimately dictated by the uh, the Fed's policy and market expectations of when the eventual rate rise uh, would take place. And of course, uh, that only just occurred this month or the prior month, December, um, going into the end of the year. So investors were wrong-footed. Everybody was expecting June at one point, and then it's pushed to September, October time, and onwards. So, um, in terms of uh, performance across each of the markets and the various asset classes, it was very much dictated by uh, a rising or strengthening dollar, uh, which finished the year up around 9% uh, versus its, uh, its peers on a trade-weighted basis, if you look at the dollar index. So emerging market currencies, um, commodities, and also um, commodity-linked currencies like the Australian dollar, um, New Zealand dollar, South African rand, and so on, um, were the hardest hit. So it was a combination of uh, both slowing, growth, slowing global growth um, across uh, across all markets and particularly uh, in Asia, Asian economies. Also over capacity coming from the likes of China and other emerging markets, which is one of the themes which we'll uh, look at in a uh, little bit further detail later on. Uh, and also the uh, the main one, the main driver, was the prospect of higher interest rates in the US uh, kicking off a, uh, a hiking cycle um, across other regions. So for the year, the S&P was pretty much flat. Um, as were treasuries, uh, I think it was actually beaten slightly by uh, treasury bonds over the year. So really um, stuck within a 10% range throughout the year. If you were um, buying the lows and selling the highs within that range, of course, you could have uh, generated uh, pretty handsome returns. But overall, uh, buy and hold investors have made no money, um, been long bonds, been long stocks. Uh, if you look at the 10-year uh, US Treasury and the S&P, as we'll look at in a moment. Yeah, you can see that uh, obviously all year we, we talked about quantitative easing uh, uh, ending in, in, in the US and, and um, but continuing in, in Europe and that uh, once again uh, underpinned uh, markets or, or uh, made markets struggle. So European equities did best because the ECB is uh, uh, continuing to, to provide stimulus and as the US is ending it and, and rates are maybe going up. Um, people are switching, have sw switched out of uh, US stocks into European stocks. Sure. So if we begin with a snapshot of currencies, we'll go through each of the asset classes. Here you can see uh, the best and the worst performing currencies uh, over the course of 2015. Um, you can actually see surprisingly that uh, given some uh, reversion after some terrible, terrible years uh, for the, uh, the peso in Argentina, um, it did finish as the strongest uh, major currency globally. This is like expanded major currencies. And uh, there's new through. government as well, right? Yeah, so there has been uh, reform and change there. So there are fundamental drives of that within the economy. It's also it, good to see India do well. Yeah, exactly. And India is a country that Secular we've, been, growth. we've been following closely for quite some time now. Um, you know, within emerging markets or amongst emerging markets, it's, uh, it's one of the more positive spots for sure. And, this, and these returns include the interest that you would get from holding the currency that's Plus right, the, the change on the year, right? Yeah, that is correct. Yes, this is a total return. Um, and then looking to the uh, looking to the losers. And this this all is the US dollar. It so is, the, so yeah. the 0 0.44 is really the interest rate you would have received on on holding dollars for a year. Sure. And the Hong Kong dollar is packed to the US dollar, similar rates. That's uh, that's why done the same. The renminbi similar kind of pack to the uh, US dollar for all facts and purposes for the moment. Mm. Um, That's maybe something to watch, I think, in, yeah, in the coming yeah, year for sure. Yeah. Um, and, then, uh, and then Brazil, shocking. Obviously, the government is, uh, is, is in disarray. Uh, iron ore, not the commodities, have totally collapsed, as we'll see later. So that's, that's a terrible return. Same for the South African rent. Um, 
and maybe some of those those uh, missing Turkey, which is close to Syria, and where there's also uh, chaos has been going on. Um, what might be interesting here is uh, is Norway and, and Canada, um, because these are these are, you know, quite wealthy countries. However, obviously, this is uh, an oil play, and they've been they've really been hit uh, hit by the the drop in oil. And if if you think that oil might bounce, then uh, you know. Norway and Canada might be the, the, the place. So we'll take a look uh, very quickly. So um, as we mentioned at the, uh, the dollar index, dictating returns and performance over the year. Um, as I say, it did finish strongly uh, going into the, uh, the final quarter, the fourth quarter of, uh, of 2015. I think it was perhaps um, you know, the consensus trade uh, of the year. So it did have pullbacks where it caught uh, a lot of Concentrated speculators out. And you can also see in, in in the first quarter, dollar index did did really well. But then, as people expected, uh, U.S. rate uh, hike cycle to be you know pushed uh, further away because U.S. wasn't as strong as expected. You know, dollar index came off again. So this thing is obviously very correlated to uh, to interest rate uh, expectations in the U.S. Sure, and of course the uh, the largest weighting within the dollar index is uh, which is a basket of of major. Uh, trading partner currencies uh, is the euro so not surprisingly um, the uh, we see the inverse here of course there are um, you know, within its own right many many fundamental reasons uh, why the euro has declined um, but basically it's a mirror uh, to uh, the extent of about 30 or 40 percent the mirror uh, image of, uh, of the dollar index performance and you can see also that I mean it's, it's been ranging for most of the year between 105 and 115 um, and those are the levels that you know. For now, if it goes back to to near these levels, you would uh, you know at one or five, you know you probably want to buy, and at one fifteen, you probably want to sell. Sure. And then the uh, the Aussie dollar, so the uh, the commodity and uh, Asian growth link currency, um, we've seen here. Of course, it has its own uh, monetary policy story as well, um, but uh, it did rally into the uh, into the fourth quarter, having endured a a torrid time throughout 2014 and certainly the first uh, kind of nine months of 2015 here. Um, so that's uh, that's one of the things that bounced back in the last few months. And also this is, this, is a play, this is a play on China, of course. And China was, you know, everybody thought that China is sort of, uh, it's the end of the world and, and, and China is collapsing. What you see here is that from about September, the market had already discounted slow growth in, in China. And you know what, they actually... Uh, you know, maybe uh, 2016 could be a year of, of a bounce, and then the Aussie dollar will be uh, one of the first uh, ways to, to, to play that. Sure. So then for commodities, 